Please open your Bibles to the book of Mark, chapter 11. It'll be in Mark, chapter 11. Get a two-week break from Hebrews. So we're in Mark, chapter 11. And it was the Palm Sunday. Some people may say, well, why is it, why is it called Palm Sunday? It was the Sunday before Resurrection Sunday, or the Sunday before Easter, when Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, where he was given a wonderful welcome. And it's called Palm Sunday because of the palm branches that were waved. And only John's gospel tells us that they were palm branches. In John chapter 12 and verse 13, it says they took branches of palm trees. In uh, the book of Mark that we're looking at today, it just called them leafy branches in chapter 11 and verse 8 that we're going to read in just a moment. But it was a, a wonderful time. Jesus had been performing miracles and healing, and they they knew their, that he was coming into town, and, and people were excited to see their king. And so in your bulletin there, there's some notes if you want to follow along that Jesus' followers were excited to see their king. We're going to look at Mark 11, verses 7 through 10. The Bible says, Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the kingdom of our father David! that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So they were excited. They, they honored Jesus by giving up their clothing and, and spreading it out on the, on the street as a way to, to honor him. And he was a person of, of recognition. And so they, that's how they honored him. Was they wanted to show him, this isn't an ordinary person that's coming. This is King Jesus coming. And it's kind of interesting when you think about their excitement that they, they stopped what they were doing. I think back to that opening song that we sang this morning, that all of their regular duties and work and, and just things that keep us busy, it all came to a stop. And they went, and they waited, and they watched for Jesus. And as He came, they they prepared the way for him by taking off their coats or garments or spreading out clothing that they had just for him to walk on as he's riding on a donkey. It may seem like an odd thing, but it was a sign of an ultimate respect. And it's we still have an opportunity today to show up for worship, right? We know on Sunday morning we have a time of, of worship, and it's special. It's a time for us to come and honor King Jesus. And to think about preparing for that, I think that really we know if we're going to come to church or not before Sunday morning. I mean, unless you just wake up very sick, um, you pretty much know by how you plan your Saturday, how late you go to bed on Saturday night, and things of that nature. If you have any plans at all about getting up the next morning, uh, do you set your alarm? What time do you set it for? I'll just see if I wake up. If I wake up, fine. If not, that you know you're not real serious about going if you don't do that, right? If you say, okay, uh, it's optional, you know. But if you say, boy, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be in God's house. I'm going to honor the king. And, and we make choices like that still. And they praised him. In verses 9 and 10, they screamed out, Hosanna. And the meaning of, of Hosanna literally means save now, or save us, we pray. And so it was a calling out to Jesus as a, as a Savior, that they wanted to be saved. Now, what they wanted to be saved from, what they wanted to be delivered from, that could be debated. Some of them may have, may have had some different ideas about who he was or what actually he would save them from. Some of them just wanted a political Savior. They wanted to be saved from the Roman Empire. They wanted to be saved from mistreatment by, by the Romans and things of that nature. While others would have had a deeper understanding that He is who He says He is. He's God in the flesh. He came to save us from our sins. And so 
we still kind of have that confusion today sometimes. You'll see it when people get confused whenever anything bad happens. Like, well, why did God allow that? Why did God allow that bad thing to happen to this innocent person, that good person? Why did that person get cancer? Why did that person die early? And it shows a misunderstanding on our part. This is not heaven. That comes later. So right now it's not, oh, if I believe in Jesus, nothing bad will, will happen to me. Uh, if this person were in political office, all my problems on earth would be solved. Those are not true, are they? And so sometimes we confuse that and we need to recognize what Jesus came to save us from was much more important than that. He came to save us from sin. He came to offer us eternal life in heaven. And none of the circumstances that we face in life can take that away. Even death. And so that's pretty strong to realize that once you know Christ... There is nothing, the Bible says, that can separate us from the love of Christ, not even death. And actually, death is what completes it, where we get to go to meet Him and live with Him and not just have faith in what He's going to do one day, but to actually experience that. So we're oftentimes too focused on the here and now. And it, it can take a conscientious effort to not get that way. We had a good discussion in Sunday school this morning. We were going through Zechariah and he prophesied not only that Jesus would come to save, but way back in Zechariah chapter 9, he prophesied that Jesus would come on a donkey, which I thought was, was really interesting that the, God even had that in his prophecy. But we talked about this idea, this concept of looking to Jesus as a more of a temporary Savior over just some issue we're facing, rather than what's so much superior is what He did, save us from sin. Somebody, for example, that, that gets obsessed with politics. I think we ought to be knowledgeable. I think we ought to vote for who we think God would want to be, to be there. Somebody that... that if you look at the biblical issues, for me, they are, number one, abortion, the right to human life. To me, that's first. Then I go to issues like, you know, gay marriage and different things like that. Is is that we clearly know what God thinks about those things. They're in His Word. So if somebody wants to twist that into something else, then they just became their own God because they threw out the Bible and they declared what was right in their mind. So I look at those issues that are biblical that I can stand on in black and white and say, this is the Word of God. Therefore, I'm going to vote for this person, not because I think they're perfect or sinless, but because their prior voting record most lines up with the Bible. I don't look to them as a Savior. It's just my responsibility as a Christian voter to vote values. Not to vote with my pocketbook, who I think is going to make the stock market go up or down, but who's going to preserve life at all ages and stages, not just with the unborn, but with the elderly, with the sick, with the people that have uh, medical problems. Value human life. That is the number one thing that I go for. But what happens when the person I vote for doesn't win? What happens when... I hear on the news and all these little Facebook posts and articles about how terrible society is and how this person that's in this political position did this terrible thing and that terrible thing. Is my hope lost? Only if I had my hope in that person. Or only if I had my hope in society. But my hope is in Jesus Christ. And so I'm not going to get obsessed with the here and now. Obsessed with, well, you know, this is what's going to happen. Or, or I'm, I'm not going to get into fear tactics. Oh, the world's going to end at 6 o'clock tonight. No, you know what? If it does, I'm ready. That's the way I look at it. Jesus can come back today. 
I could die today. Jesus could come back 10,000 years from now. It doesn't matter. I'm ready now. I will be ready then. But I'm not going to live my life worrying about all the details of the here and now. Or sitting in front of a TV set, getting worked up about what this politician did or what that athlete said or whatever. I'm gonna, God gave me one life to live. I need to be salt and light. I need, to, I need to be representing Christ in a society that desperately needs Him. That definitely needs the truth. So, that's why I preach through books of the Bible. Because it's not about just coming up and reading a little passage and then grabbing a whole bunch of news articles and, and getting off the subject. But to say, God gave us His Word. If we stick with that, we're going to be just fine. But some people are looking for Jesus for those things. I want you to solve this problem. I want you to solve that problem. If this person's ruling things, if they're our sheriff, if they're our president, if they're our senator, our governor, I just can't be happy. Uh, no, nonsense. Think about the people that worship Jesus that live in a country that won't even allow it. What if you were in a communistic country? What if you were in a Muslim nation? What about those people in Iraq that love Jesus? What about the people in China that love Jesus? What if they had that mindset that a lot of us have? That, oh, we just got to fix the government. Then, then I could be happy. What if, what if your ruler was one of those in one of those areas? They didn't even allow you to have a church gathering. So what we need to do is say, you know what, I'm not going to stop being informed. I'm not going to stop speaking my mind or voting for my values. I'm not going to back down on any of that. But I'm not going to let it determine the peace that I have in Christ. God wants us to be joyful. He wants people to look at our lives and say, they're different. They're living with a victorious attitude even though they're not pleased with this or you know, they have sickness in their family or they just got a divorce or they just lost their job or whatever it might be and to say, you know what, there is something different about that person. And that's an opportunity for us to say, his name is Jesus. I can tell you about him. So with the second coming of Christ... Just like they're excited at this time for the coming of Jesus, now in our day, it's that second coming of Jesus. He's coming back. He's coming again. And we don't know when, but we ought to be ready. We ought to be worshiping Him. We ought to be following Him. And to know whether He comes back first or whether I die first, I'm going to be ready no matter what. But I can't predict all of those things. We also see here that Jesus is concerned with what is going on in houses of worship. It's kind of interesting. He comes in on Palm Sunday, big party. What's he do when he gets into town? Verse 11, Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. First place he went. I'm going to go check out my church. So when he had looked around at all the things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So he goes in, he takes a little bit of an inventory, and then he goes off with the disciples because it's late. But, he comes back. In verse 15, the very next day, he returned to the temple. In Mark 11:15, it says, So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares, which means merchandise, to the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When evening had come, he went out of the city. We learn a lot about Jesus, reading his word. That's why we have it. A lot of people would have been so impressed 
with the entry there on Palm Sunday and the warm welcome that he received that he would have a lot of humans, just people that are we're just um, seem to be care care about popularity and power. A lot of people, a lot of us would have just enjoyed that moment and wanted it to last forever. These people love me. Look what they're doing for me. But Jesus, although I'm sure he appreciated it, he wasn't really concerned in pleasing everyone. When he went into the temple and he saw what was in there, that it had basically become a, a business, a place of merchandise selling, he came in and he cleaned it up. And he was not concerned with his popularity. He said, I'm going to get rid of these things. And so it, we can ask the question, what, what does Jesus think of our present day houses of worship? There are many places that call themselves churches that don't even mention Jesus. Or appear to be having something that you know is just totally entertainment based or in some places seems to lift up the preacher or the pastor or the music or some event as the drawing card it's supposed to be about Jesus it's supposed to be all about Him. So, what does Jesus think of First Baptist Laplace? Well, we're, we are far from perfect. Because we're sinners, saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I hope that Jesus is pleased with our church. Because I do believe that in everything that we do, in, in Sunday school, in worship, in our Awana children's ministry at, at 5 o'clock, uh, which we'll meet this evening, in our Wednesday night, when our youth meet at 6 o'clock, and when our adults have Bible study and prayer time, we are promoting someone and His name is Jesus. It's all about Him. Our teachings are from the Word of God. And we seek to lift Him up. Our vision statement that you'll see on the, the front of your bulletin every week. It's with our logo, First Baptist Laplace, reverent to God, relevant to you. What does that mean? Reverent to God. God is holy. He's listed first. It's about God. Everything that we do ought to, ought to lift Him up, ought to point somebody to Christ. Say, wow, this church is about Jesus. We're reverent to Him. He is holy. Secondly, relevant to you. What's that mean? Well, it means that we're just not here to be religious. We're just not here to check things off of the list and say, okay, I'm part of a religious institution. But to say, okay, all of you are busy. If you will take your time to participate and what this church has to offer, we firmly believe that you will walk away with something from the Word of God that will apply to your life. That you'll be able to say, I'm glad I was there. That was time well spent. I was able to worship God. I was able to go to somewhere where, where my mind is, is thinking about spiritual things. Where I'm drawing closer to God in my time there because I'm learning more about Him. So that's what that means. It may sound simple, but it is simple. God didn't mean for it to be complicated. Salvation is very simple. We're sinners. We are lost and on our way to hell. God loves us. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell, so He sent His Son Jesus to live a sinless life, to be a perfect, sinless sacrifice, to die on the cross for our sins, to shed His blood on that cross, to be buried, and to rise again the third day. That we worship a risen living Savior, and that every single person that wants to be saved can be saved. That is the gospel. And it is simple. And church is to be simple. It's supposed to be all about Jesus. 
And so that's what I would encourage everyone to look for in a church. Not, not the perfect church, or all you'll do is church hop your whole life. Be critical of every place you ever go. But to look for a church that loves Jesus. That believes that every word of the Scripture is the Word of God. And that has a pastor that cares more about what Jesus thinks than what people think. There is nothing that compares to the church. I do get irritated when somebody wants to, a businessman wants to tell me how the church is a business, we need to run it like a business, and we need to uh, have this marketing strategy to get more customers and blah, blah, blah. I say, well, not the church that I pastor, because we are not marketing. Evangelism isn't marketing. You're supposed to be leading people to Christ, not just lead them to your church. And so there is an accountability there to Christ, and it's important that we, that we never forget that, that we recognize that I, I am more fearful of disappointing Jesus, because I'm going to stand before him one day, than I am disappointing you. I love you, and I want you to be pleased with me as your pastor, but I can't seek that approval. I have to seek obedience and faithfulness to Christ, and just accept whatever whatever the consequences are of that. Thirdly, in this passage, we see that as believers, we can live our lives with a joy that is not conditioned by our circumstances. We touched on that already. That is difficult, really, when you think about it. As believers, we can live our lives with a joy that is not conditioned by our circumstances. Boy, that's easy to say. Hard, hard to live. And think about what has to happen in your life for you to be really upset. For you to lose your focus and become angry, sad, dramatic, overreactive. For some people, it could be that the water wasn't hot enough at shower time in the morning. The whole day is ruined. A bad hair day. Oh, my hair is frizzy today. I don't have that problem. But I mean, seriously, some of us, it doesn't take much to just, you would just think the world was over. And then we see other people Relationship problems, lose a job, financial problems, health problems. Man, how do they hold it together? And we thought, you know, what would it be like to be a Christian in a nation that doesn't even allow you to be a Christian? You know, people that have to have these underground churches that no one else really knows they're meeting. They have a you know, just a, they meet in a basement or somebody's living room and they can't, they can't talk about it outside, you know, without being in trouble. Think about a pastor seed uh, that's in prison for his faith simply because he won't denounce his, his Christian faith. How does he do it? Boy, his circumstances are terrible. His wife and children live in Idaho. They don't get to see their father. He's in the Middle East in a jail cell for years, been physically beaten. He got sent to the hospital one time. They let him go to a hospital. As he was being released from the hospital to go back to prison, they physically beat him in the hospital before they let him go. How does he do it? For years. It can't, his faith can't be based on his circumstances. It's got to be about God. It's got to be about that personal relationship. No matter what happened to Jesus during his earthly life, he lived to be approximately 33 years of age. No matter what happened in his life, he was the Son of God. He's also God in the flesh. Jesus is God. 
who he was, who he is, never changed. And his circumstances changed rapidly. We're just going to look at a snapshot, a week in review of his last week leading up to the cross. I mean, he knew what it was like to be popular, especially those times he was healing, was touching sick people and they'd be better. He was performing miracles like feeding the 5,000. You can better believe he was like a, a superstar to those people following him and watching him perform cool miracles. When he arrived on Palm Sunday, what an awesome way to start off a week. People singing, spreading clothes out. That was awesome. But Monday came. Monday's the day we read about where he confronted evil in the, in the temple. He lost some popularity points that day. Tuesday, we didn't cover these verses, but that was covered in verses 27 to 33. His authority is challenged by the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. That was a tough day for him. Tuesday and Wednesday go through chapter 13, something that I forgot to share with you at the beginning that I think is interesting. Mark's gospel is 16 chapters long and covers just over a three-year period. But out of those 16 chapters, the last six chapters cover one week. So we have a lot of details here about the last week leading up to the cross. So Tuesday and Wednesday, he teaches in Jerusalem in chapter 13. They're long, tiring days. On Thursday, that's when we have the Passover and the Lord's Supper. On that Thursday after the Lord's Supper was complete, Jesus was arrested and one of his closest friends, Peter, denied him, not once, not twice, but three times. His best buddy denying that he even knew who he was. His friends were turning their backs on him. He was then convicted by an illegal nighttime trial, ironically convicted for claiming to be God, which he is. It was an unfair and heartbreaking day. On that Friday, we call it Good Friday now, this is chapter 15, Pilate fails in his leadership role that he had, and he wanted to be a people pleaser instead of a God pleaser. And he gave the people what they wanted against what he knew was right, against what his wife told him to do. So a lot of people are elbowing their husbands now. I told you so. He allowed Jesus to be scourged and crucified. Jesus was mocked, beaten, and eventually murdered on a cross right in front of his mother. That happened on the Friday, the same week that Palm Sunday happened. Just a few days later, what happened to all of his followers? His popularity with people was sporadic, much like our commitment to him today. Hot and cold, off and on. One day we're going to stand before him and give an account. We need to be faithful day in, day out without excuse. He doesn't need a fair-weather friend. Peter learned from that mistake, became one of the boldest witnesses for Christ that this world has ever seen after that. But we don't want to, there's a lot of ways to deny him. And one of them is just the way we live our lives. It may not be with saying verbally that we don't believe in him, but it may just be that we live our lives as if he makes no difference. We only have one life to live. Saturday was a relatively calm day that week as Jesus remained in the tomb. But that Sunday morning, when the ladies came to the tomb, that stone had been rolled away. Jesus wasn't in there. His, folds, his clothes were neatly folded. And an angel told the ladies that he's not here. He's risen. Why do you seek the dead among the living? Or the living among the dead. So it ended very well. 
It's also interesting of how humble Jesus came. Riding on a donkey. There's a lot we can learn from His leadership. A lot that we can see about Him in in a ways of, of living a humble life for Him. Then in verse... Uh, all the way skipping over to chapter 14, we get to the Lord's Supper. This was on Thursday evening. In a moment, we're going to be partaking of the Lord's Supper. And what I would ask for you, the biblical requirements of, of taking the Lord's Supper would be that, you, that it's for baptized believers. And so I know that can be awkward if you have uh, you know, young children that may not uh, been saved and baptized yet. Uh, they may want to grab for that bread and that juice, but that's where I need you, you know, to, to say, you know, listen, we're going to talk about that, but, but it's for baptized, uh, believers. Let's read this together in chapter 14, starting in verse 22. It says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. There's a couple of things that we need to remember every time we partake of the Lord's Supper. It is a time where we are to remember Jesus' sacrifice until His return. We talked last week about how most of the Christian life is lived in the present looking forward, but that every now and then God calls us to look back to the past and learn something from it. And the Lord's Supper is one of those times where He says, yes, the cross is empty. Yes, Jesus is alive and we live with victory in Jesus and He's not suffering. He's not in pain. He's paid for that sin once and for all. So we live in the victory of what He's already done. But when we take of the Lord's Supper, He does want us to reflect back and think about the price that He paid. Think about the pain that He endured. That's why in the Scripture, when you read about leading up to the cross, that He doesn't want us to miss the pain and suffering that He endured to pay for, for my sin. That yes, I can be forgiven. Yes, Salvation is free for me. But it wasn't free for Him. It cost Him His life. Jesus suffered to save Paul Naylor because Paul Naylor chose to sin. And I need to know that. I need to know that my sin was a reason He needed to die. Not just for the sins of the world in general, but for each one of us. He says, For often, in 1 Corinthians 11.26, He says, For often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. He wants us to remember the sacrifice. We will not take the Lord's Supper in heaven. This is one of those things that will end when we, when we, when we go to heaven. He wants us to proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. To remember to not forget the sacrifice He made until Jesus comes back. It's also a time for self-examination. This is another one of those times where, for a reason, God calls us to look back at our past for a moment. In 1 Corinthians 11, 27-32, the Bible says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. When he says in verse 28, let a man examine himself, it's a Greek word, dakamazo, and it means let a man put himself on trial. Not let other people put you on trial and judge you for the things that they think you've done. But it's self-examination. It's me coming to God in prayer, saying, God, please reveal to me the areas in my life 
that are not pleasing to you. Just between you and me, God, show me where I need to be more like you. That, that's a humbling thing right there. Because you won't get up from that prayer thinking, oh, I'm perfect. I'm just where God wants me to be. Self-examination. And then it's a coming to God. If there's other people that I need to ask forgiveness for, I need to go to them and do that. If they're just things that I'm doing that I need to change, I need to make those commitments to God so that when I partake of the Lord's Supper, I'm not saying, God, I'm perfect before you. I'm saying, God, I'm right with you based on what, your son, what you did on the cross for me when you paid for my sin. I've asked you to forgive me. I've taken the steps I need to take to get those things right. And I'm, I'm living in fellowship with Jesus. And that passage in 1 Corinthians is, is interesting because he tells us that some people have literally died. He uses the word sleep in that passage because they took of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. So we don't want to take it lightly. That's why every time we have the Lord's Supper, the whole service is, is, is leading up to that. And we're talking about it. We're not just taking the, the bread and the juice without understanding what they mean. That the, that the bread is representing the body of Christ. That, that the, the juice is representing the blood that He shed on the cross. So it's a time of remembering the sacrifice and, and self-examination. We're going to have a, a time of invitation where I'm going to pray in just a moment. We're going to sing a song. And during this time, we're, we're giving you an opportunity. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord, I want to encourage you to use this time to come up and, and speak to me and say, Pastor, I, I want to be saved right now today. Or I have a question about the Bible. But if you have anything else in your life, I just want to encourage everyone to just pray where you're at during this time. This is something that during the Lord's Supper, I, every time I preach actually, I always make sure I have that time with the Lord before I ever walk into this room where I've prayed and, and, and asked God to reveal things in my life that are not pleasing to Him. And I, I just want to encourage you, if you want Brother Tommy to, to sing a solo because you're, you're too busy praying, He'll understand that. It ought to really be a time of self-examination and prayer as we prepare our, our hearts to partake of the Lord's Supper. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we love You. God, we're so thankful to be in Your house today. Thank You for dying on the cross for our sins. Thank You for making that payment for our sin. Thank You for using Your Word to communicate to us about You. Lord, if there's somebody here today that recognizes today who You are, that You are Lord, that You are God, that You are the one and only way to heaven, and that anyone that wants to be saved can be. God, I pray that someone today would make that eternal decision to come to know You personally by being willing to pray a prayer Something like, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I cannot save myself. I believe that You are God. I believe that You died on the cross for my sins, that You were buried, that You rose again the third day and You are alive today. Please come into my heart and forgive me of my sin and be my Lord and Savior. God, if somebody's ready to make that commitment to You today, I pray they would respond right now. Lord, for the rest of us, I pray we would, would just go, to, go in prayer to You. It's right where we're standing. Just bow our head and close our eyes and be silently communicating with You, Lord. Getting right with You before we partake of Your Supper. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.